Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. And what about Donald Trump, Bill? He did not uh, agree to sit for this 60 Minutes interview. According to 60 Minutes, the Trump campaign offered, quote, shifting explanations, including complaining that 60 Minutes planned to fact check the interview as, according to the journalists there, they do every story. And they said that both campaigns understood that if one of them backed out, they would still agree to do the interview with the other, which is what ended up happening. Notable, too, also in the wake of the 60 Minutes interview with Kamala Harris, President Trump is complaining online that he said that it had been cut and sliced and diced, possibly illegally, possibly a campaign finance violation. Bill, what do you make of this? Uh, I mean, should Trump have sat for that kind of interview as well? Or does he have his own liabilities when he sits down in a form that is less friendly than he is used to? Well, I think what we see in this is Donald Trump doing Donald Trump and attacking and so forth. He didn't do the interview. He didn't do the second debate. But I think there's no equivalence. Donald Trump ran in the primaries did so much media, recently went to the National Association of Black Journalists. He went mostly to places that disagreed with him, and he answered the questions. And more important than interviews, I think, are press conferences. Kamala Harris, I believe, will be the first person to go through an election cycle and not give any press conference. And that's deliberate. Now, all that being said, I agree with everything Alicia said about the Harris campaign and what they're deciding to do. I think it might be their best strategy. From the 60 minutes where she was pressed on some answers, it's clear Kamala Harris can't answer them. She does not come across well when she's unscripted and on the spot. So their best bet is to do the minimum, do enough where they can say, we're in a media blitz. Even the term media blitz is ridiculous. It's absurd. We're a month away from the election. And just now she's getting around to talking a few interviewers, mostly Democrats or people who have endorsed her, outright endorsed her. So I think it's a terrible thing that she's not asked. It reminds me of the last election where Hunter Biden's laptop came out. It was squelched by the media, came out a little over two weeks before the election. And the 51 intelligence analysts, you know, put out a phony document saying it was probably uh, Russian disinformation. All they had to do was get through the next two weeks. Right now, I think they're doing the same where Kamala Harris thinks, I just got to get through the November election and then we'll worry about the rest later. And it's working to some degree. That's probably our best bet. And some of the risk aversion may simply reflect the closeness of this race. The real clear polling average now has Kamala Harris up two points nationally. But as everyone knows, we don't have a national presidential election. We have an electoral college decided state by state. Uh, checking in on some of these swing states, Wisconsin, Harris up 0.8. Michigan, Harris up 0.5. North Carolina, Trump up 0.6. Pennsylvania, Trump up 0.2. So, Alicia, we'll give you the last word, but some of this loss aversion, if I can put it that way, seems to be just the, the narrowness, the tightness of the race. Each of these candidates trying to avoid any last mistake that could shift those numbers, the 10th or 2 or 3 that could decide this election in some of these pivotal states. Well, I think that's actually being charitable to the Harris campaign. I, I think the deeper problem is that she it's just an insubstantial campaign. She just hasn't really thought about these issues. But I do agree with on the point that, you know, her campaign staff and, and her policy advisors do not want to put out any policy proposals or statements that could potentially push voters over to Trump, may cause any kind of blowback. She's trying to actually backtrack on a number of her policies, the EV mandate for one in Michigan, because she's realized that that's not very popular there. So she's trying to kind of whitewash and obfuscate what that her policy position on that is. And so, yes, I do agree with you that she is risk averse, but I also think that there's a larger problem that she just hasn't thought very much about these issues or any issues. And that could hurt her in itself to the extent that voters think that she's just not fit and prepared to be president. 
Thank you, Alicia and Bill. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button, and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.